Welcome to Central News, I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, scientists have returned from a two-week survey to the north, north of New Zealand near the Kermadec Islands with photos and footage of new-to-science fish. In seven days of sampling, they took over 6,500 photographs and caught about 100 fish. They have discovered a new species of eel pout and new records of a rat tail fish that hasn't previously been caught in the southwest Pacific, another rat tail that hasn't been caught in New Zealand waters for over 100 years, and a large deep sea cusk eel. The voyage covered waters well below the depth that light penetrates, sampling depths between 1 to 6 kilometres on the edge of the Kermadec Trench. It is one of the deepest places on Earth with depths exceeding 10 kilometres. The Rethinking Local Government Conference was a good first step in making sure the Bay of Plenty communities are well informed and ready for whatever change may come for local councils, according to the Regional Mayors and Chair of the Regional Council. The conference organised by the Tauranga Chamber of Commerce enabled a number of local bodies, authorities and ratepayers to discuss the ramifications of the Local Government Amendment Act 2012 for the future councils in the Bay. Regional Mayors and Chair of Bay Plenty Regional Council, who all attended the conference, agreed on the following joint statement. Bay of Plenty is a unique region and getting the governance structure right is vital. They won't just accept a one-size-fits-all policy because what works in one region may not work so well in another. Consultation and engagement with stakeholders, community and iwi will also be an integral part of the decision-making process. Exhibition sites are nearing full occupancy for the 45th New Zealand National Agricultural Field Days, even though the event is still months away. Outdoor agribusiness sites are fully sold out and the sought-after indoor Mystery Creek Pavilion is fully subscribed. Over 97% of all sites at field days have been acquired by businesses keen to exhibit at New Zealand's premier agriculture and agribusiness expo and field day organisers are expecting to reach capacity well ahead of previous years. Companies exhibiting in the redesigned premier feature area will be showcasing the 2013 theme, Getting Down to Business in the Global Economy. The theme highlights New Zealand's unique position as an innovative agribusiness driven economy to capitalise on the growing international demand for food, protein and agricultural expertise. Now for our region's weather for Friday. Hamilton will be fine with a few light winds. Your expected high is 26 and an overnight low of 12. Tauranga, your Friday will be mainly fine with light winds and sea breezes. Your expected high is 25 and an overnight low of 15. Just ahead, it is a nearly kiwi fruit season. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. The kiwi fruit season will start in a few months' time, and with the effects of PSA well and truly being felt, I caught up with Zespri to see what is predicted for this season. So the fruit's currently busy growing on the vines at the moment. Summertime's here, and it's enjoying some really good dry weather. Um, so we're expecting a you know a good season. And harvest starts about March time, autumn, goes through till about June, and then the first ships start sailing around Easter. So off to the markets about that time. How is Esprit preparing for this year? Well, like every year, fruit quality is the, the key for us. So we're busy working with growers, understanding the, the intricacies of this year, of this season, some of the new varieties which are on the vines, making sure that they're focused on quality, on consistent taste, and making sure that they've got the best product heading to market. Of course, the relationships in the market are, are key for us, and we're just working on our promotional campaigns, ensuring that our distributors and retailers are all set for the coming season, and then making sure that logistically we're all prepared, the ships are ready to go, and that we've got all the planning sorted for the coming year. Is this year predicted to be worse, even worse, than last year due to PSA? Um, the impact of, of PSA is starting to be felt this year, that's for sure, but it's, it's less about the disease itself and the way that growers have um, uh, reacted to it. So there's been a significant transition from the old Hort 16A variety to Gold 3. And so that means that, of course, it takes two or three years before they start coming back into full production. So there is a, a, a real impact felt from a gold perspective. But green volumes are still up there where they've been for the last few years. There is a bit of a seasonal fluctuation, but um, green volumes are looking pretty good this year. Are there any new developments on the PSA front? 
I think we're learning all the time. Um, the knowledge is improving and the way that growers are reacting is also, um, you know, they're getting better and better at what they do. They're learning to live with PSA now. So, you know, there's a $10 million um, uh, fund of money which has been invested in research to date. There's about 70 different projects on the go. There have been 300 different products which have been tested in their efficacy against PSA. And growers are doing things differently. They've, 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 you know, they've put new varieties into their orchards which are more resistant. They're doing things differently. They're operating differently. They're using new infrastructure, for example, covering their orchards. And little by little, I think the, um, you know, the, the, the balance is shifting in our favour. So lots of small steps. There is no one silver bullet, but a whole lot of small steps, which is shifting um, things back in our, in our favour. And how is the J3 variety progressing? Well, it's still pretty early to, to draw any firm conclusions, but it is looking pretty good out there. Um, I guess it's performed as we've expected and that the majority of people seem to be growing through um, relatively successfully, but not everybody is, is enjoying that uh, degree of success. Location seems to have an impact on, on how G3 is performing. Similarly with Hort 16A, it was uh, you know, uh, uh, an issue with Hort 16A. And then management practices again, you, you need to be very proactive, you need to be exemplary in the way that you're uh, managing your orchard. And um, so those things are impacting on it. But overall, I think we're still um, pretty optimistic that G3 is going to be viable going forward. Kiwi fruit used to be nearly 10% of New Zealand's horticulture export. It was even ahead of dairy produce. Where is it now? Uh, I mean, it still is. Uh, kiwi fruit is still our, our most successful horticultural export, no doubt about that. Um, there's about a billion dollars worth of export sales which are uh, accruing to New Zealand kiwi fruit growers. That's a really significant number in terms of our total horticultural exports. And for this region, for the Bay of Plenty in particular, it's really, really important. It's a significant part of our GDP, and, and there, you know, much of the community spins off from the benefits of kiwi fruit. So, very important for us. Do you think 2013 will be better? Well, 2012 hasn't been a bad year. I think overall we've, we've, um, we've had some pretty successful results. We're quite pleased with the way that the marketing effort has gone. Um, of course, production, from a production perspective, we are challenged by PSA, but in the market, things are still looking really, really positive, and there are some positive signals for the future. 2013, we know that our gold volumes are coming back. We know that we've got a reasonably significant green crop, but it does allow us opportunities to optimise those sales, to allocate to our better performing markets and ensure that we are getting um, the optimal return that we can for New Zealand growers. The f I guess the ironic thing about PSA is that between the haves and the have-nots there, there is a widening gap. Those growers who are still managing to grow kiwi fruit and, um, and, and, and export their, their production are getting really uh, extra good returns. Um, but those who haven't are getting nothing of course and, and so that gap is widening and that's really challenging to, to, to maintain the, the community sentiment and, and ensure that people are still motivated going forward but that's just an unfortunate reality. I mean, I guess that kind of creates some sort of division in the kiwi fruit industry. Oh, I don't know if there's division um, or, or jealousy in terms of looking across the fence at what's going on. I think um, the fact that the the market returns are still so positive that um, growers, uh, you know, they have a good reason to get out of bed in the morning and continue to to fight and ensure that their orchards are viable. That's a that's a really good positive thing for us. Of course, providing them with all of the tools that they can to to, to get themselves through. Uh, is important for us, but but ultimately, you know, growers are, I think pleased that they they see a viable industry going on around them, even if they've got a year or two of of um, time just to just to get back into production themselves. Because 2012 saw record global sales for Zespri, how is that even possible with PSA? Well, I think what you've seen in 2012 is is um, market returns have been have been really really good so we've had a, a crop which has been uh, a little bit different in terms of the balance between gold and green um, that's allowed us to to probably reallocate to our better performing markets uh, and we've pushed really really hard in the market in 2012 to ensure that we're getting the best return for growers that's both uh, for gold and for green and we've seen just that balance shifting a little bit between the green gold mix uh, and that really has driven extra good returns now we'll see that following through for the next uh, year or two as well as gold volumes are, are down uh, and as we see green volumes creeping back a little bit as people transition into, into the new varieties also. So it's positive in the market. Uh, again, the disparity between the growers who have little or no production and the growers who have a good crop is, is really significant and challenging. Coming up next, cats and our wildlife.
welcome back. It's been a hot topic around the country and while we would prefer not to discuss whether a cat is an appropriate pet or not, we did find out from the Department of Conservation just how you can help restrict your pet from killing our native wildlife. OK, um, domestic cats, given a chance, will hunt and they've, well, most of the cats in towns and cities will catch rodents, you know, rats and native birds. They will, especially ones that are living near native habitats, catch native birds like tui have been recorded, um, kereroo, silver eyes, fantails. They also catch reptiles. Um, there's one case of a cat in, Palmas in New Plymouth uh, getting a taste for a rather rare gecko and they'll also eat native insects. However, from the department's perspective, it's actually feral cats that are the bigger issue. And they're cats that have either been dumped in the pit, or the descendants of cats that have been dumped, stray cats, and they've got no contact with humans and breed in the wild. And they're having a major impact on native birds, um, reptiles, bats, and insects. And that's where the department's concern, main concern is. So, what it, I mean, is there any statistics around how many feral cats? I mean, it's hard to kind of. There's plenty of um, scientific evidence. Uh, there's just some of the examples are one cat, one feral cat over seven days killed over 100 threatened short tailed bats at one roost site. Another feral cat that was caught in central Otago was found to contain 49 endangered skinks in its stomach, so it had eaten them in one city in effect. Um, some video footage of monitoring nests in the Mackenzie Basin of black stilts and shorebirds found that 43% of the predation events were actually due to cats. And I think the other really major one is that the reason that Kākāpō are now on offshore islands is that the last population in Stewart Island, a natural population as such, in Stewart Island in the 1970s and 80s, was suffering such high cat predation, they each had to remove all the Kākāpō to offshore islands. Feral cats, uh, sorry, domestic cats, it's a little bit more um, difficult to work out their impacts, because actually only 25% of the animals that cats catch, they bring back to their owner. The other lot, uh, the other 75% are either eaten or just left where they're killed. However, there is a little bit of evidence that they are having an impact. So there's a recent study from Dunedin where uh, they found that certainly fantail and silver eye populations in the city were unlikely to survive in the face of cat predation without more birds migrating into the city. And another example is there was a study in Christchurch around a wetland looking at domestic cats and a significant number of native skinks were brought in out of the wetland by these cats, their owners. So obviously more the problem is feral cats. Yeah. What can we do to tackle that? Um, from the Department of Conservation's perspective, we will control feral cats on public conservation land where they're doing, causing a problem. However, we need to actually consider in perspective of there's a wide range of other mammalian predators in New Zealand. You've got stoats, uh, ferrets, weasels, hedgehogs, rodents, um, and they're all having an impact. So from the department's perspective, we don't just look at cats in isolation, we actually look at them as that whole range of predators and control them all at sites, our key sites. But see, I always thought that, you know, cats actually kill rodents. Yeah, um, that's always an argument that, you know, cats are doing a benefit. In actual fact, certainly in forested situations, rodent numbers are driven by their food supply and cats and stoat numbers increase in relation to the rodent numbers, then when the rodent numbers crash because their food runs out, you've got a lot of hungry cats and stoats looking for something else to eat. It's a bit of a catch-22. Um, so uh, I've always had the perception that actually dogs do more damage than your household cat. Um, in certain situations, dogs, certainly roaming 
pets and also farm dogs or working dogs have been a major issue in places where they ground birds like kiwi, uh, weka and other native ground birds. And there's a classic example in 1990, between 1990 and 1995, um, over 50% of the kiwi deaths that were reported in Northland, that was 135 birds were killed by dogs, kiwi were killed by dogs. So they are a significant issue around certainly kiwi areas. Do, so do you think if we start de-sexing our animals that will help the situation? New Zealand does suffer an overpopulation of pets and thousands of kittens are born every year that are unwanted. They get handed into the SPCA or animal shelters and unfortunately most of them are actually euthanized because they can't find homes for them. And the ones that aren't handed in are often either left to go stray or dumped and many of them will actually die but those that survive will actually supplement the wild, the feral cat population causing havoc with their wildlife. Visit doc.gov.nz forward slash conservation to find out more. Stay tuned as up next we meet a local who is now national president. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. A Tauranga local has been appointed the new president of the New Zealand Nurses Organisation. I spoke with Marion Guy to find out what her new role involves. Well, it's quite exciting because it's the first time the New Zealand Nurses Organisation has had a full-time paid president. It's a joint chairmanship with the um, Kai Whakahairi, who is also a full-time paid position. So we'll be working together um, for all nurses in New Zealand. So what was the voting process? Well, over the last couple of years, the Nurses Organisation has undergone a change from a rule book to an empowering constitution. And part of that was to have a full-time paid president and kai whakahairi. And the voting process was delayed because it had to go through the legal process to get the, um, to get the constitution ratified. So the process went, was over eight weeks, but unfortunately it was over Christmas, so I'm sure a lot of nurses were on holiday and not thinking about voting. But um, it was an eight week process where you could have a postal vote or you could go online and, and vote. Unfortunately I hear that the online voting wasn't as great as we'd hoped. So you'd think in this day and age with technology that nurses would find that a lot easier and less time consuming. So we'll have to look into that and see why, um, why nurses are not voting. Were you surprised to be voted? Very surprised. I mean, you always hope that you're going to win when you stand for an election, and you stand because you want to. And um, yes, I was very surprised to um, finally come out the winner, and um, I feel honoured and I feel quite humble as well. So what does the role actually involve? Well, I don't start for another month, and um, I see it as being available for nurses. Uh, the president is representing the members as a, as a um, governance role, not an operational role. So I would hope that I would have time to um, visit nurses in their workplaces, advocate, support, um, promote and just assist, give advice, be a liaison between staff and, and the member um, and just help out wherever, use some of my nursing knowledge and experience. What is the New Zealand Nurses Organisation? Well, it's a professional and an industrial organisation and it also offers legal support. So a lot of nurses join for the indemnity insurance um, and the Nurses Organisation has lawyers that are medico-legal lawyers, so they understand the processes better, they understand nurses, they understand the situation. So we have that aspect and then we have the professional arm which, which looks after policies, um, helps with seminars, forums, and just the professional side of nursing. And then there's the industrial side, which is the MECAs, the multi-employment contract agreements. And so it's quite, it covers a vast array of options for nurses. 
How many members are there in the organisation? We've got um, just over 46,000 and that, that is an 80% coverage of nurses in New Zealand so it's, it's a big organisation. It's not just nurses, it's midwives, um, caregivers, allied health as well so it's, it's a range of people. So what are you actually hoping to achieve in this role? Well, I have been asked that by a number of people already and I think our biggest focus we need to start and look at students. We're training a lot more students than there are positions for and I think students are our future nurses and we need to nurture and help them and support them in whatever way. So I'd like to get in and try and help students. I think the aged care sector is another area where they're still underpaid as far as other scales of nurse, nursing specialties are and also their educational opportunities are, seem to be less. They seem, so I'd like to try and work with the aged care sector. I mean those areas are two huge areas but it's just in generally I'd like to raise the professional profile of nurses and have nurses wanting to, to join the workforce. What do you think about where the nursing profession is now? You hear varying comments of nurses stress, not enough support, but when you go overseas, because uh, I'm on the International Council of Nurses Board as well, and you hear what nurses in other countries have to put up with, in New Zealand we're actually doing quite well. Um, but it's getting that message across and maybe it's looking at working differently, doing things differently. Um, you still hear of understaffing, uh, stress, and you get that worldwide. It's, that's a, not just a New Zealand issue, that's a global issue. And, you know, if I can help in some way to deal with that, then I'll try. So what would you say to a young aspiring nurse? I would say go for it. Uh, nursing has been so good to me. It's taken me far beyond what I could have ever imagined when I first trained to be a nurse. And I'd say if you want to go nursing, go for it and just take the opportunities. That's what I've done as along the way. I've taken opportunities as they've come. Things have felt right. I've stood for positions and I've been successful in that. And I would um, encourage anyone to be a nurse. You'll always get a job. There's always a job. That is the news for today. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I will be back tomorrow night with more guests from in and around our regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.